Hello everyone, Dr. Data Science here to teach you data science methods and tools today, tomorrow, and beyond. This video answers a very important question. How can we evaluate the performance of clustering algorithms? You are probably familiar with classification evaluation metrics, such as accuracy, precision, or recall, and you may be tempted to use those when evaluating clustering algorithms, but you shouldn't do that. And you see why in this video. And before we, we get started, please don't forget to like and subscribe. And this will help uh, me to show these videos to more uh, interested people like you. So in order to warm up, let's consider a simple Python example. And in this video, I'm going to use Google Clap, which is a free computing resource provided by Google, works very much similar to Google Doc. So you can just create this Google Cloud file and then you can run um, basically any uh, code that we have here. Because we're working with uh, arrays here, I'm gonna import NumPy as NP. And Scikit-Learn is also a machine learning library that has benchmark data sets and has the implementation of classification and clustering algorithms and many more things. Well, what I'm going to do here, I'm going to load this iris flower data set. And here I have one example. That's how the iris flower looks like in general. And when you download this data from Scikit-Learn, you see that you can use dot keys method to see different uh, sort of like parts of this data set. If you want to find the input data, meaning that the feature metrics, uh, and here we have uh, four different uh, types of features. We have length and width of two different parts of flower. Uh, you have to use um, the data part. And then if you want to find the labels, meaning that uh, whether each flower belongs to one of the three classes, you can use this target, right? And that's why I'm going to always look at the shape of these arrays. So you can see that X is 150 by four. So this means that I have 150 flowers and, or samples and four features for each of them. And then the label, which is why that shape, you see that it's 150 dimensional array, which is a one dimensional array has a, that has 150 elements. And I always like to use mp.unique and this will tell me the unique elements of this uh, vector of uh, labels or targets. And we can see that we have zero, one, and two. So that's why I mentioned just a few moments ago that we have three different types of flowers uh, or uh, classes here. But in order to make this problem simpler and we can visualize everything, that's sort of like my goal in this video to simplify um, understanding the problem. Um, I'm going to only work with two of the features. So I'm going to index feature uh, number or index two and three. And this is the petal length and width. And I'm going to also convert this from a three class classification problem into a binary classification by checking each target value and see whether if it is equal to two or not. So if it is, then you know, it would be true. And when I convert this to an integer, which is this part, I get one. And otherwise, I get zero. So I'm going to, again, look at the shapes and also np.unique, which gives me the unique elements of the, uh, the, the vector of uh, labels. And you can see that now we have a binary classification problem. So what is the main difference between supervised and unsupervised learning problem? We can see that on the left figure, we have a supervised problem. In this case, our training data consists of the input features and the corresponding labels. So that's why here we have everything color coded, right? So we have X 150 and Y 150. So we have 150 training examples here. And in this case, I've just used logistic regression to separate these two classes. And you can see that the sort of like the dashed black line that separates the two uh, classes. However, in unsupervised learning, which is the figure that you see on the right, we can see that now uh, we don't have any more labels. So this means that our training data consists of X1 to X 150. 
and there is extra 150 here that we don't need it. So you can see that here, we only have these input features, which are these sort of like black circles here that you see in a two dimensional plane, but you know we don't have those labels. And the goal of unsupervised learning or specifically here clustering is that we want to find groups or clusters of similar samples. And one thing that I want to here emphasize that is gonna help uh, later on to better understand the problem is that on the left, when I have a supervised learning problem, I call these two as different classes, right? And then here, let's say I have a method that tells me that this is one group and this is one group and I call this cluster. So usually when we say class, that means that that refers to actually like label data and that's uh, how we define each class based on the samples that they have exactly the same labels. But here for unsupervised learning, we usually use the term cluster for each group and we don't call them anymore class. That's something important uh, to keep in mind later on that you're gonna discuss about different evaluation metrics. Because here the uh, main idea is evaluating clustering algorithms. I'm not focusing on what type of clustering algorithm we use. And I have another video that I have explained three different uh, clustering algorithms that uh, you should definitely know. But here I'm using the simplest one, which in my opinion is k-means. What happens is that we are going to have uh, different clusters and each cluster is represented by a cluster representative or cluster centroid. That's what we call a centroid or center. And uh, as I mentioned earlier, uh, CycleLearn has the implementation of k-means. The only important parameter here is the number of clusters. And the other thing that I've done here, which is very useful, uh, and, and if you don't know it, I'll definitely recommend you to use it, is that you can use the method dot fit and dot predict for training and prediction, but you can also merge them together if you just care about the labels. So that one here I'm using fit underscore predict. So I can get the labels of those uh, sort of like samples in clusters in one line of code here. So I don't have to do uh, write the training and testing uh, or prediction part separately. And here you can see that um, the, the one that, uh, because here we color coded based on the predicted values, which I showed them with y underscore pred one. And the reason I call this uh, predicted one, because in the next slide, I have another set of predictions. So I wanted to uh, set the difference here. And the reason for that, uh, I can explain this here is because we have this random state here and random state tells us how we initialize the k-means clustering algorithm. The final solution of k-means depends on the initialization and um, this random state makes sure that by uh, giving the seed for the random number generator, we get the same result if we run this multiple times. So here I set this random state to one and that's the result that I get. And then I'm going to plot this using these uh, predicted labels. So you can see that the blue ones, which is this P, is the one for uh, cluster one. So this is cluster that is being labeled as one. And then the red one, which is R, is the one that is being labeled by cluster zero. So this is what the chemist clustering algorithm returns. Samples that belong to cluster zero, and samples that belong to cluster one. And one thing that you may want to do is similar to the way that you um, define accuracy for classification problems, you may be tempted to just compare the predicted labels with the true labels or ground truth labels and see how many of them are exactly identical and then divide this by the total number of samples. And that's the result that we get. So we, we noticed that in almost like 32% of cases, we have identical labels. So now to make this problem a little bit more complicated, let's again use the k-means clustering algorithm, but just change the random state, meaning that that initialization part. And ideally we should be able to get the same result because this is relatively a simple problem. And that's why I show here with ypred2, that's why I have label them as one and two here. 
And let's look at the results here, because if you look at this one with the one that we have in the previous slide, you see that the reds and blues are sort of like, uh, like they have in different places right now, right? So the blue ones are the ones that label cluster one. Remember before they were cluster zero, so now they are cluster one. And the red ones, which is this R, now it's clustered uh, as label zero. So now you may want to again compare these predicted labels or return labels with, um, with the ground truth or actual labels that we have in Y, and you get 67%. Well, that's kind of like surprising because you had uh, so like accuracy of 32% in the previous slide, and you'll basically get the same result, just changing the colors here, and you get 67%. So why is this happening. The reason that this is happening is that in unsupervised learning, we don't have any reference labels. So what the clustering algorithm does is just tells you that these blue ones are in the same cluster and the red ones are in the same cluster. And the algorithm doesn't know here what one and zero means, just assigns one of them one and assigns the other one zero. And obviously you can see here that even by changing the initialization, we can switch these labels. So this is a very important problem and this shouldn't affect the way that we evaluate clustering because obviously this result and the previous one are exactly identical and we shouldn't get in one case 32% and the other one 67%. I'm not saying that the 67% is correct but what I'm just saying is that uh, we definitely have some type of inconsistency here. And that's, again, the summary of what I just mentioned, right? So these are the ground truth labels. So this is what it was included in my data set when I imported the iris flower data set. This is what I got in the first case. And this is what I got in the second example. And you can see that the difference between these two is just that the blues and reds are switched. But other than that, we have exactly the same cluster in both cases. So these two things are literally like equivalent to each other. So what, what did we learn here? So for accuracy for classification, what you can do is that we have um, these ground truth or true labels. And then we have these predicted or return labels. And what we can do is to use this indicator function, which is this one. So this one, and then we have this condition inside, means that if the condition inside this parenthesis is true, this indicator function returns one. And if it's not true, returns zero. So it's exactly equivalent of that np.sum. And then I use double uh, equal signs in the previous slide. This is a mathematical representation of that. So this measures, how uh, like the sort of like the normalized number of uh, labels that are identical. However, for clustering methods, you cannot just simply compare ground truth and uh, return labels. You have to look at different permutations of these labels. So this part, and here, I think I made a simple uh, mistake here because we have n elements. So this is technically indexed at zero. This is something that uh, I'm going to fix here, right? Because usually in math, we index things from one, but in Python, it starts from zero. And from zero to n minus one, we have n elements. So that's what I just like uh, fixed here. And so this part is exactly the same as what we have here, except the fact that now we have to look at all the permutations and look at the maximum of them. So trying to find the best assignment that we can find to sort of like match these return labels with the true labels. So one way of thinking about this is to use something that is called V measure. And in order to find this V measure, we have to define two other concepts. One of them is this homogeneity, and the other one is completeness. So what is homogeneity? A perfectly homogeneous clustering is one where each cluster 
has samples belonging to the same class labels. That's why here I told you before that I want to distinguish between the way I define cluster and class. So when I say cluster, it means that what uh, or whatever the clustering algorithm returns as the same group. So if we have this cluster and a lot of samples in it, and those samples that all belong to the same actual class label, then this means that we have a perfectly homogeneous case. A trivial case here is that when you class cluster each data point separately, so you can see here, I have a simple example with four data points. And if I cluster them into four groups, now when I look at, let's say like this red one, this has only samples from one label, from one class label. And this is just because, you know, we are just restricting each cluster to be one, uh, include one, uh, one sample from a class. And obviously this is not, you know, uh, what we want to do because then it's pointless to do clustering, but it is something that gives you a perfectly homogeneous clustering. But what is completeness? Completeness is almost the opposite side of this. A perfectly complete clustering is where all samples that belong to the same class are actually grouped into the same cluster. And one trivial case of this is, let's say here again, we have four uh, data samples instead of 150. And when we just assign all of them to one cluster, right? So you can see that now this is a perfectly complete case because all samples that belong to the same class are grouped into the same cluster. Obviously we cannot contradict this. So you can see the sort of like the tension that we have here between homogeneity and completeness. So now we can define something called the V measure. So as I said, we measure relates to homogeneity and completeness. And we have the equation given here in cyclic learn. So here we have a parameter called beta. And let me just write this equation. So the way that we define this um, sort of like a score, the V measure score is as one plus beta times homogeneity times C. And then we divide this by beta times H plus C. And it is also common to set beta here equal to one. So you can see that that's the, so like the default value. So when beta is equal to one, then this measure would be simply two H times C over H plus C. And uh, this is basically the harmonic mean between homogeneity and completeness. So it is definitely better in this case that both H and C have larger values and uh, if one of them is really large and one of them is really small, then that definitely reduces the value of V, which is not something that we want for a high quality clustering. But the point that is really important here is that if we look at this V measure score and we uh, compute this using those to predict the labels from our example, now we can see that we get back the same results regardless of the initialization technique that we use. And that's because here we have taken into consideration the fact that we have this permutation of the cluster labels. To just summarize this talk today, so we noticed that evaluating clustering algorithms is difficult task. And we can do this in two ways. We can use the ground truth labels, which means that the labels that you can have access to when you download the data set, uh, and in this case, we call these external measures because these measures or these uh, metrics depend on some external source to give us those labels. And these includes like things such as this V measure that we talk about, normalized mutual information and so on. And then on the other hand, in many cases, we don't have enough labels or ground truth labels to evaluate the clustering performance. And in these cases, we have to rely on just some geometric properties, such as cohesion and separation, meaning that how, how much um, like variation we have in each cluster and uh, can we identify the separation level between them? You know, because obviously, uh, clusters, we want to be like the points inside clusters, we want to be as close as possible together. And then points from different clusters, we want to be as far as possible from each other. 
And we're going to talk about these two. So we are going to, the second part of this video, we're going to talk about things such as normalized mutual information or NMI. Uh, here, we're going to talk about uh, also some other internal measures 